three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to a very special semi-final episode of the Texas Private School Podcast. As always, I am one-third of your hosting crew, Wes Tolleson, joining you from College Station, Texas. Walker Lott and Ryan Schroeder join me from College Station and Stillwater, Oklahoma, respectively. Walker Lott, your thoughts on the last week in private school football? Great week in private school football. A lot of upsets. Uh, crazy, crazy week in private school football. Um, this is why we all love it. Uh, you know, we got, we got chirped a lot over this weekend, but that's why we do it. Thank you all for always the interaction. Uh, a lot of the videos, a lot of the, what happened? Uh, we love it. And, uh, what happened? Uh, um, but you know, Ryan knows a lot about that after Bedlam. Oh, Ryan absolutely does. Ryan, we will transition right into that. Your thoughts on uh, y'all getting smacked around in Bedlam, as well as the, <laughs> us getting memed to death by everyone on Twitter over the past week. Well, you said I was in Stillwater. I'm actually in Frisco. Um, oh, that is off. true. Um, anyways, second off, uh, yeah, Oklahoma State lost to Oklahoma and Bedlam. If anybody lives under a rock. What's the um, boomer so, signal? Isn't there a hand sign for boomer? Yeah, it's the what's it called? It's the one thing. It's like the this thing, which I don't know what this even means. Like, like aren't the, the whole thing supposed to be how they ride the back of like a, a, a carriage thing or whatever? A sooner. A sooner. That's sooner. Right, that's, that's not a sooner. Don't tell it's me it's schooner. A sooner. Sorry. It's schooner. Schooner is the schooner. correct term. Yeah, it's not stupid. I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Wait, can so, we give some reference by the way? We're this is a it's eleven twenty four at night on a Monday. And uh, it's, it's so my fault. It's so my fault. I was at Fort oh, Christian it's, today it's covering fun. I I was at Fort Christian Day covering the 7-Eleven Classic. Um, we'll we'll have some good basketball talk coming up soon, but just know that uh, Fort Christian fans uh, were telling me everything that they believe while I was there. Uh, all the football fans, everything, Luke Anderson, everybody was coming up to me. So, but, oh, absolutely. Go on. You know, you know how like there's Pac-12 after dark, and it's just like the best thing ever. This is Texas Private School Podcast after dark. Just think of it like that. No, it 100 percent is, and so many things have gone wrong. Like we spent 30 minutes before the episode trying to fix my camera. As you haven't noticed, my I'm using my Mac, my Mac camera, not my professional, not professional, my Canon camera to video, which is why I'm going to keep looking up over the camera like I'm looking at my original camera. It's a whole mess. We also spent 30 minutes um, creating what I think is the greatest thing we've done on this podcast so far that we will get to at the midpoint of the episode. Please, if you watch nothing else, watch what we created at the midpoint of the episode. It involves soccer, and that's all I'm going to give you. But with that being said, we are now going to recap our last week's picks. We all, <laughs> this is the first week ever on the podcast. We all picked the exact same slate, the same all the way down. We all went 12 and four, which honestly, it seems like we did a lot worse because we lost three games of the week and were chirped relentlessly for it. Uh, me and Walker had phones pulled on us like the paparazzi was out after the Nolan Catholic game. It was honestly hilarious. But as the records stand in aggregate, I still lead all scores 157 to 65. Ryan is 154 and 68, three games behind me. Walker is 142 and 80. Walker is probably more or less mathematically eliminated from the pick contest at this point. So Walker, I'll give you, uh, I'm not going to do that math. But we're going to say for all intents and purposes, Walker as as a final statement before you're, you are sent off the Island, your thoughts on your participation <laughs> in the, in the pick record this season. Uh, started off strong. I got too carried away in the, for, in the middle weeks and you know, that came back to bite me. And, you know, sometimes I need to pick more on logic than heart. And that's, that was my downfall this year. That's fair, but I, I respect you going out on a limb and at least making things interesting. That's better than picking chalk every week. Salute to you, good sir. Thank you. Ryan Schroeder, how does it feel that you were going to take second place in this year's uh, pick record? There's still a couple more weeks, bro. Give me two more weeks. Give me two more weeks and I can do it. I'm just going to pick every, everything you pick. I'm picking the opposite. <laughs> That's fair. I told Walker before we started mm. recording that what I'm going to tail every single one of your picks and just make sure that we have to say, <laughs> no, I'll take both no, of my you, records. You pick before me. You pick before me. That's I, how it always I works. Know. 
I know I thought of that. I'll, I, I'll just I'll just go back and change my pick on the pick sheet when we put it out Friday. I'll say actually no. Then that then that'll yeah, that'll that's result a West in Hall, two, that's a West Hall. Yeah, that's a West. That'll Hall. result in you yeah. two in you two making some kind of bogus rule that I have a I have some kind of double pick <laughs> penalty for going back on my pick, which I still I'm going to win this year in spite of that garbage. It does not matter. Anyways. I don't know how that's the most passionate we've been about picks all year, but that'll conclude us discussing our pick records. TXPS after dark folks moving into our second segment players of the week. And as for the Texas private school podcast, offensive player of the week, senior quarterback, Brady Dever from Fort Bend Christian Academy. Dever accounted for 400 total yards, four touchdowns and zero turnovers in a quarterfinal win against Austin Regents. I saw this with my own two eyes. It was one of the better performances I've ever seen live. Dever, Several times had his back against the wall with the season and his high school career hanging in the balance. And each time he stepped up, delivered, and gave ultimately Fort Bend the win here. Walker, um, an incredible performance from an incredible player that we have been keeping track on since we started the podcast. Your thoughts on Brady Dever winning our Offensive Player of the Week? Yeah, what a turnaround from when I watched him against Second Baptist. The culture there never switched, and he came back strong and won them the game. You know, sometimes you just Maybe a player just needs to have the lights turn on. The moment needs to be the brightest, and he came to play. Um, you know, uh, you've got to be proud of the kid. You know, the Fort Bend has been around, been behind him, you know, all the way, and he they just rallied around him. And Brady Dever came to play and upset the number two team in the division, and that's a big win. There's a reason, you know, we all picked Regents because the offense was, you know, sometimes there, sometimes not. But with you know Domino being added. They were back into the pace of being really, really good these past couple weeks, and it continued this week, and it was a big, big performance, and he needed to play the game of his career to win, and Brady Dever did just that, so congrats to him. He certainly did. Ryan Schroeder, Brady Dever, our Offensive Player of the Week. Your thoughts on the seniors' outstanding performance? Yeah, Brady Dever's insane, dude. That guy has been good for so long, and he's the reason why Fort Ben Christian wins games. Um, He is a leader on this team, has been. Um, and he's probably the reason why this team has had so much success. And part of the reason why we thought this team was going to have success coming into the year was through his senior leadership. So um, shout out to Brady Dever. You, we know that he's going to go off in this next game as well. Absolutely. So congratulations to Brady Dever, our off te- uh, the Texas Private School Podcast Offensive Player of the Week. Now transitioning into the Texas Private School Podcast Defensive Player of the Week, senior Robert Sanders from Fort Worth All Saints. Sanders had two interceptions, a forced fumble, and a sack, and an upset win over Argyle Liberty. Ryan Schroeder, you saw Robert Sanders in action, obviously a crazy stat line and a huge upset for the Saints. Your thoughts on Robert Sanders garnering our Defensive Player of the Week? Yeah, I was talking to, to a couple guys today about uh, how he is, uh, what's called Jonathan Vaughn, and uh, as well as Easton Hub. I was telling them, I was like, hey, like, Robert Sanders might be the best D2 defense, I think I can say, best D2 defensive player um, out of anybody. Just because of the way he plays, I I think the stats would back it up, too. He had a pick six, a pick six against last time against I think Fourth Christian. I, I don't know if I'm getting that right at all, but uh, he's had two interceptions in multiple games um, this year, and he had two interceptions in this game. He, it, according to someone, uh, he apparently knows plays off the rip. Will call out a play uh, that the offense is running just from his film knowledge. He'll call out a play, and then immediately when he calls out that play. Uh, what's called he'll like go up and tip the play and go intercept it from like the lineman position he he's just an elite player um and honestly you're gonna you're, there's a reason why he's going to i think dartmouth he's going to princeton princeton there's a reason why he's going to princeton it's because he's just elite and he just his ball knowledge is crazy like it's it's by far one of the best that i've seen out of any defensive player yeah, definitely so. I mean that that's crazy, and that just that's the mark. That's what separates good players from great players. When you're that athletic, but you also have the discipline to study film to that extent that you know what the offense is running before the play is even snapped. That's crazy. Walker Lot, obviously a fantastic performance. Your thoughts on our defensive player of the week? Yeah, you know if you if you follow it for a while, like I guess I have. He was actually a quarterback coming out like in middle school, eighth grade, ninth grade. And, you know, he kind of made the switch when uh, 
Hamp Fay was over there at quarterback and he made a switch to defense and he found his love there. And he found that, hey, I was pretty dang good at defense too. And seeing the journey to be like an elite pass rusher, um, you know, eight sacks, I think, on the season right now. Um, just a fantastic performance. He had another fantastic performance the week before uh, against who was it they played a week ago? But um, um what it does it doesn't matter. But he I know he had a great performance then too as well. Um just back to back. Oh, great by faith. And he just had to make sure he was ready to go these past couple of weeks. And like the IQ of the kid, like you said, Ryan is just unmatched. And having a guy who studies film is like you said, like as much as him, that's so deadly, especially in the high school game where most people don't study the film as much as other guys. And having a guy who knows what you're going to be doing, like, you know how back in the day, a lot of people said Luke Keekley was that type of player, right? That he could read a defense and just know what you're saying before you said it. Like that's that's so deadly as a defensive warrior, and I'm just that's very very impressive. Another big win for him. Congrats. He's Absolutely. also he's also huge, by the way. I forgot to mention that he's just a big dude. So he's not the type of guy you wanted to face off off coming off the edge. Oh, I'm no sure doubt. I've seen I've seen pictures, but I'm sure it's even more stark in person. But all that being said, congratulations to Robert Sanders. Congratulations to Fort Worth All Saints. Big win for the Texas Private School Podcast Defensive Player of the Week. And now, as always, we'll transition before talking about last week's matchups. We will take a look at the TXPS Media Scoreboard powered by Ryan Schroeder. So. Guys, we'll get to our five games of the week on the left tab here, but other things that stand out, Preston would absolutely destroy St. Pius, more or less expected. Obviously, we're going to, well, actually, we didn't, did we know if All Saints Liberty was not, yeah, yes, it was one of our the games. games Sorry. De- the games that we definitely did talk about is Fort Worth, All Saints Liberty, or Fort Worth, All Saints versus Liberty, um, and of course, St. Thomas versus TCA Addison. Um uh, Jack Closick, our you know SBC correspondent, was watching that game, and he said, "Uh, there was it was tied, I believe, or it was they were down or something along those lines." And Dante Lewis went down there through a beautiful fade route to Schaefer Henderson in the corner for the win. Um, big, big drive. And Dante Lewis, we've been talking about all year, is that dude. Um, they have weapons all over the field. You just got to give them the ball. And Dante Lewis is pretty dang good at doing that, too. So that's a big win for St. Thomas over T.C. Addison team, which we thought was good. But um, honestly, like we thought St. Thomas was the second best team in the state um, a couple weeks back. But I think it's kind of showing now, Wes, right, Wes and Ryan, that the North is much better than the South this year. Um, and I guess we kind of get some bias because we're always down in the South. So we have to cover these games more. And so we watch these teams more, but sometimes like we forget sometimes the North, especially in division one is like, it's even the lower teams is really, really good. Yeah, definitely. So and that was really stark watching like Nolan Antonian and, and other things like that. Like it's, it's very, very evident as always that the North is objectively better than the South. We're going to see how that plays out through the rest of playoffs, but it was just, it was very, very evident this week more than ever. Ryan, any, any additional thoughts you have on the scoreboard? Yeah, honestly, uh, I just, a lot of the games, we, we were able to get to a lot of games this week if we're being completely fair. I mean, I went to two games, so y'all went to, two games um so just we were out at a lot of games and the only thing i have to say is uh parish and uh dallas christian both know how to cover <laughs> yeah oh you you are correct they they both do and uh we will actually talk about both of those games we're not going to get to ask um if they cover in our segment because we're picking both of those teams and asking if they would cover it's going to give away our picks for those games but you are correct. DC and Parrish both know how to cover. But that will actually conclude our comments on the scoreboard from last week. And now Ryan's going to give a rundown of the two games he got to witness on Saturday. Fort Worth All Saints versus Liberty, as well as Parrish versus Bishop Lynch. So, Ryan, tell us what you saw and your thoughts on the two games you witnessed. Yeah, so uh, Friday night at Birdville, I froze my butt off um, and was covering Fort Worth All Saints and Liberty. I showed up at the field and I thought to myself, all right, well, I'm about to watch Liberty go up and smack these boys. Um, however, I was completely wrong. Um, I could not have been more wrong, actually. Uh, however, Brady Janicek and um, Vaughn both had a really, really good game in this game. Obviously, Janicek was all over the field on the offensive and defensive end. He's one of the only guys that I feel like that like is elite on both sides when it comes to like a D2 player. Uh, but, yeah, like he was their offense, and he's elite. 
However, on the on the on the forward All Saints side, we just talked to you about Robert Sanders, and you know how good Robert Sanders is. But I can't go without saying Jalen Spriggs. Jalen Spriggs is a tough, tough quarterback to play against. He it's just very. He also has that kind of like swagger to him. I wanted to mention that because he just he's very swaggerish, um, if that's a word. But he had 190 total yards, four total touchdowns, three in the air, and one on the ground. Um, and the defense set them up perfectly, though. The reason why he doesn't have a ton of yards is because the defense would just put them in the most beautiful positions to score. And so he, they scored all the time, but they were getting picks and all that kind of stuff, setting them up in the perfect place. Um, one of the biggest routes of the night was a touchdown to Chris Bell Freeman. Um, other long touchdown was to Javon uh, Williams. Williams. Yeah, he was also a stud. Um, honestly, just a team full of guys that – um, play really well together, and now that they're all healthy, it's going to be super fun seeing them play against Forwards Christian. Um, but yeah, honestly, like we said, defense is great for the All Saints. Um, fun watching them. Other game, I'll go into it really quickly. Parish and Bishop Lynch started off really good for Bishop Lynch. Uh, as they score first, seven nothing. I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, all right, Bishop Lynch, like, you know, got out there early. Uh, and then Parrish scores, but then they score again, and then Parrish scores, and then Parrish kept scoring. Um, so, yeah, basically that's what that's kind of what happens when, when uh, Parrish plays you. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, for a team that literally went two and eight um, in, or two and seven in the regular season um, and basically went out and beat Central Catholic first round and kind of went toe-to-toe with the Parrish team. However, Parrish um, – also, like, hadn't played a game in two weeks. So, I, I was talking to Trey Williams, and, or I, I don't remember. I, was doing, I think I was talking to Trey. Uh, one of the other guys on Parrish, and I was talking to him, and I was like, hey. I was like, it was kind of crazy at first. It was kind of close. And you're talking to Hamburger. Uh, I was talking to them at first, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was like it's, it's kind of a close game. And he goes, yeah, we just haven't played in two weeks. And I was like, all right, whatever. So, then they started getting on their horse. But uh, I can't. With that, I can't not mention Sawyer Anderson. 332 yards and four touchdowns. And they took him out with, like, a whole quarter and a half left to play. Like, he is so good. Uh, if you haven't heard about him yet, he's the 2025. He also has a ton of swagger. I thought I mentioned that as well. Um, really? Cedric Mays, that, that, that seems different from last year because he was, like, he still looked very young last year. He barely even filled out his pads. He was he was great, don't get me wrong, but there wasn't any, there wasn't any moxie there yet. Sorry, when I say swagger, I kind of don't mean the same as I feel like for Jalen Spriggs. He has the swagger that like he's the biggest guy there almost. And like 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 he's like like he's kind of like a celebrity almost, right? Like, you know, he's not one that's gonna look at the camera, he's not one that's gonna look your way. Like he knows the media like everybody's looking at him. He knows everybody's trying to take this photo. Um, but like, yeah, he also doesn't fill out his pads. He's yeah, he, he's still kind of a smaller guy, but he's just like he knows he's like the dude there. So um that's what I was. That's what I was gonna say. He doesn't. He doesn't have the swagger like uh, uh, Deion Spriggs does. However, Cedric Mays, Maddox Reed, both of the guys, they split touches a little bit. Um, for when they actually did run the ball, they didn't run the ball that much. But when they did run the ball, Maddox and Maddox and Cedric uh, split the touches. Cedric had a hundred yards. Um, Maddox had thirty-one yards. Maddox also got hurt in this game, but he still scored twice. Um, but yeah, Maddox. Maddox was still a really, really, really good player. Hopefully, he can play this next game. Um, I know he was hurting, but Chase Bur- uh, Burton is it? Is that how you say that? Chase, Chase Burton? I don't know. How to say his name. I, w- I would uh, guess Burton, but I don't know. We've been wrong many times on pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, he's a stud. Uh, I pr- think it was him that went up and uh, mossed somebody this weekend. Uh, he put it on somebody. He was head tapping somebody. So uh, he's a stud. Basically, basically, well, I'm just gonna be very real. Sawyer Anderson kind of just threw it up there, and he went up and got it. Um, and then the other guy, Derek Eusebio. Yus- yeah, Derek Eusebio. Right? Eusebio, dude, also uh, like a super tough player. He also had kind of the same thing. I sort of threw it in the exact same spot, and Derek went up and got it as well. So tough guys. Obviously, Trey Williams is a dog as well on the defensive end. He got three tackles for loss in this game. Um, and, yeah, I, James Cave and him are kind of just like elite players on the defensive side. Um, and honestly, Parrish, this, this team is just so freaking good. So uh, shout out to Parrish. Um, uh, the Bishop Lynch quarterback, uh, what's his name? Legend uh, Howell. Yeah, his name's Legend. His, uh, his tag on Twitter is called QB Legend. Same on Instagram. Very funny. Uh, but yeah, QB Legend. I think he's a freshman, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, 2026. 
Uh, he is very small for his build right now, but he will he will get a little bit bulkier over the years. Still super impressive. He was launching the ball um, when he was on offense. Uh, the one touchdown they scored, who they threw it to number six. I uh, can't remember his name off the top of my head. Dude, that ball was absolutely launched in the air to him. Um, legend's going to get really good over the next three years. He's going to be a legend. No, actually, I can't guarantee that. But honestly, Parrish, Bishop Lynch, um, it was kind of fun being there. Super cool atmosphere. It was not cold. Um, so, yeah, good game. Definitely nice. So that's that's a good recap of both of those games. Like like you said, we got a we got a ton of ground covered. We got four games between us covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got four games between. That's crazy. That, I think that's the most productive week we've had so far. But it's always like that when we get to playoffs. So it's it's very fun to see as many games as we possibly can in this short period of time. But moving on to the first game of the week from last week that we're gonna recap. And the most appropriate, considering I think it was the game of the year in private school, Fort Bend versus Regents. Fort Bend wins 27 to 24. I mean, this game was everything you wanted and more. The second that Brady Dever pulled the ball on a read option and went 80 yards to the crib on the, the Eagles' first play from scrimmage, I immediately knew we were in for an instant classic. I mean, that's what we were. I mean, Dever threw – he went 19 of 32 for 301 passing yards, three passing touchdowns, 91 rushing yards, and a rushing touchdown. Domino had eight receptions, 121 yards, and two touchdowns. Braylon Gardoni had seven receptions for 105 yards. Sophomore Tyler Curry had two receptions for 42 yards, but those both of those two receptions came on the final drive of the game to win the game for the Eagles. And the last one was a game-winning touchdown that Dever had to just scramble. Um, the Regents had been terrorizing him all night in the backfield, and he finally got away and he got some space, and he found Curry on a whip route on the left side of the end zone, and he just found him. And Curry turned into a star on that last drive. The the windows that Dever was fitting these balls into was ridiculous. I can't speak enough to how much I how much I respect this Eagles offense. It is very, very good. But I mean, Regents had a good game as well. Freshman quarterback Quinn Murphy ends his fantastic um first season campaign here, going 209 yards, two passing touchdowns, 19 for 27. Jackson Smith for Regents. Um, he's a senior, so he just played his last game this year. Is another guy I have to shout out. He is, I think, maybe the most underrated guy in all of private school football. He's he's very short. He's probably all of about five nine, maybe. But he is super super quick. I mean, it, it's kind of a lazy take to compare any any short white receiver to Cole Beasley. But it, it does kind of fit. The dude is super quick. He was a great weapon all year for Quinn Murphy, you know. But you have to you have to tip your cap to Regents um, on still what was a fantastic season. But Fort Bend gets the win here. I've talked enough myself already. Walker Lot, we all pick Regents to win this game. Fort Bend had other plans. Your thoughts on the Eagles getting the win? Yeah, it's a big win for them. Uh, yeah, you know, some like we kind of I said earlier, like it's sometimes. Uh, it was interesting this year because sometimes you got the Fort Bend that you expected coming into this year, and sometimes you did it. And I it feels like them and Fort Worth All Saints really have come into their own what we expected them before the season in the past couple of weeks and really in the playoffs, which, hey, it, that's when it matters. So that's really when, it, when you needed to play your best, and that's what they're doing right now. Brady Dever is that guy. He had a great performance. Brian Domino Gardoni got theirs too, um, having big receivers, big-time games. Um, yeah, Regents, you know, Quinn Murphy as a freshman had a fantastic season. But I'm gonna I'm gonna propose a question for my kind of ending thing. You know, we talked about it, right? That that firstly, District Three didn't no one besides Regents got out of the first round. Do you think that playing six district games, right, for Regents or how many uh, as there were, d does it like keep them like does it hinder them basically for not playing the best like best opponents week after week to get them ready for playoffs? Your thoughts? We've talked about this. We we you proposed that in the car ride home from Austin, and my thoughts are in recent years, yes, because we saw them bow out early um, in the playoffs last year as well. But I think traditionally, no, they're always a team that's been more or less in the state championship. I don't think this is a long running storyline. Right. I think it's hindered them in the past. In the past couple of years, I think you can certainly make the argument. But I'm curious, Ryan, your thoughts on that. So, yeah, from my opinion on this, I just think that uh, 
I think that Regan's, yes, obviously you do play those teams, but those teams actually were better this year than they True. actually ha- ever have been, right? High yeah, Tech a little was bit. good this year. Brownsville St. Joseph was good this year. Um, you know, that's a, maybe maybe the first time in a while these two teams have been really, like two other teams have been really, really good, right? Um, St. Joseph's giving them a game within 10, right? You know what I'm saying? So you, I, that, it, you're comparing them to Regents who ended up losing se- in, in the second round, right? But I think it, this year was the year that they basically challenged them so if it, I, I don't feel like that claim stands true just because they actually did challenge them this year and they still lost in the second round. That'll conclude our thoughts on the Regents Fort Bend Christian game. Again, it, it, up to this point, I don't know if it'll be surpassed the game of the year in private school football. Moving on into Fort Worth Christian versus Midland, a game that might be the most infamous game in private school football to this point. Long story short, Midland was up 14 to nothing at halftime. A Blake Pruitt touchdown plus a pick six. Then Luke Anderson came in because um, he was suspended for the first half due to an ejection in the previous game. And in the second play of the half, he took the ball 61 yards to the crib. Blake Pruitt then responded the first play of the next drive, 65 yards to the house. Back-to-back field goals by Midland and then Fort Worth Christian Christian score 14 points to win the game. That's all fine and good. Walker, um, at the very end of the game, very controversial call. There was an onside kick by Fort Worth Christian that didn't go the distance. However, it hit a Midland player in the back, and then it looked like a Midland player dove for it and a Fort Worth Christian player dove for it at the same time. The The consensus opinion among people is that Midland Christian recovered the ball. I I would assume that based on the footage, although there's nothing to, I've watched that play over and over again. There's nothing definitive. There's nothing that could overturn a call that I can gather from that film, but there's a lot of controversy. So we might as well talk about it. Your thoughts on that final onside kick and, and the resulting win for Fort Worth Christian. I mean, in my opinion, I think Midland got it. If you look at it, I think it was more Midland got on it and then Fort Worth Christian got on it as well. But it was more not the point of he got it. It was more he was trying to get it out of him, in my opinion. Um, yeah, but they won. But I think that I think it's a very interesting thing. I don't think I don't know why the ref called it so quickly. You know, yeah, most so of like do- very so like quickly. that's my, that's the more of the issue. With no, mine. no reason to do that. You can right. confer. You could confer with everybody there. You have six refs on that field. Confer like for right. sure. Why would you not? That's more my suspicion. Not suspicion, but just like why. That's Here, my, here's my a counterpoint, and I, I don't agree necessarily with what I'm saying, but it's just devil's advocate. What if he didn't want there to be enough time for there to be a scramble on the bottom of the pile with that effect? But, the, pro- but the problem with that, there was no pile. It was two people. Right. That's a good so, point. So the, you can't really yeah. say that. And, you know, officiating was a factor on both sides. We've heard, you know, 100 Midland had a, over 100 yards and penalties. And then, you know, the big one at the end of the game, too, I've heard that was a face mask penalty uh, that took him out of field goal range. Um, you know, the quarter, the kicker that was two for two in field goals that game took them out of field goal range and they missed the, the game winning kick. So that's huge. So that's another, you know, but. I've heard, you know, fourth Christian got a lot of calls that were not called their way too. So it was a, just a bad officiating game weekend and we, uh, through and through. But at the end of the day, you know, they were up. What was that? Uh, What? 14, I believe around the, around that month, 13, I guess the actual amount is Um, they were down 13 fourth Christian in that time. You have to, you have to kick, kick them out. And we said, it, I think on the space, right? Wes, like I said, how much you that first half you're gonna have to score a lot of points because when Luke Anderson comes in, he's gonna be a game changer and he's gonna make his presence known. And he did that very quickly. Um and, and also at the end of the day, even if Fourth Christian got that ball, in my opinion, he didn't, but if he got that ball in the, the onside, right? You still have to stop him. Right. And not saying that it, it's not like you didn't get screwed or anything like that. The defense has to step up in that way. That's just sometimes part of the game. And trust me, I've I've had my fair share of bad officials. I know it. You know, everyone knows taps refs, taps referees. I did it for Halloween. I get it. We all get it. <laughs> we. It's not like me and Wes have not experienced this growing up. We know the feeling. So, um, but it's part of it. And sometimes you have to win, and you also have to beat the refs too. 
And that's just part of the game. Uh, USA had that today in Qatar. I mean, you had a bad referees there. It's part of the game. It's part of all the games, even at the biggest stage in the world. Um, but um, f- you, fair play for these four with Christian guys. They never, they never quit. And Midland never really punched, knocked them out. And they kept crawling and crawling, and they got themselves to win in the end. I'd have to agree. I think, uh, barring any other additional comments that either of you want to say, I think we've covered this game. Go on. I, I, I do want to say this because I, I want to give my two cents a little bit. Um, so after talking to a couple people as well, even today, it's like Hogan Nelson's been banged up a ton. Um, obviously, guys at Midland know that. Um, you're going to try to hit Hogan a little bit harder in this game, you know, so like, you know, he kind of feels it a little bit, right? Um, whatever mindset you may have, you, everybody knows the injuries of everybody else, right? So when it comes down to that, there may have been some tough play on both sides. Officiating goes which way or whatever. Um, I do believe as well that the Midland guy fell on top of it first. However, the call was made instantaneously for no reason at all. The uh, one, the one ref, the back just sees Bryce Bradley almost with the ball in his hands and almost just immediately says that. And he must have convinced the other refs that way as well, which if you see Bryce Bradley with the ball, kind of like taking it out of his hand, like, you know, it's just there's a lot of questions with that. But I 100% agree with you, Walker. How do you let them score 13 points in three minutes? Like, you can't let that happen. Or it might have been two minutes. How do you – you had a whole – so uh, from what I understand, they there was three minutes left when – they got the ball back or something like that. They get the ball, they score. Then there's – they score, then again. When the, so they get the onside, then score again. There's one minute remaining in the game for Midland to come drive down and kick a field goal. So they basically scored two touchdowns in almost three or three or four minutes, right? Yeah. You cannot let that happen. You cannot no. let that happen. Um, and I think that's more of just the fact of, you know, you, you got so stuck up on the fact that you – and also you have to you have to recover that onside kick. Like, like let's be very fair. Like, onside kicks are almost like an uh, 80 or 90% probability that the that the receiving team is going to end up in the – with the ball. Like, you have to – you have to fall on that ball. Um, so, yeah. Well, lots of errors led to that, obviously officiating and stuff like that. But, yeah, Midland, Midland you, you got to also stop them as well. Um, but for Christian – yeah, I'm, I'm excited though. Four Christian over four with All Saints. I kind of kind of like the underdog. I kind of like the three and four seeds coming to do it instead of the one and two seeds. It makes it interesting. And even like it, it you also have to think like if you were you know special teams coaching, if that guy didn't have his back to it, it never touched him and didn't go, it would not have gone ten right. yards. Like you got to think flag. of all, got to think of all yeah. those things too. But uh, you know, insane game. I feel for the Midland Christian guys because. At the end of the day, uh, coming down to a penalty that could have just knee the game and you know called game right there, that hurts. Um, you know, and you never want you never want a game like look back at because of a call. That's just never how you want sports to be, um, and that's how this game is going to look back at it. But you know, at a whole, it's a rough game both sides. But you know, Fourth Christian comes out on top and are still the end like comeback kings. And you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they do uh, against a ready to go for with Christian or for with all saints team this week. A health, yeah. healthy all saints team. Exactly. That is, that is a very important point to stretch, but that is all that we have regarding Fort Worth Christian and Midland Christian. Now we will move into recapping TCS Lubbock versus grace prep, a game that TCS Lubbock wins 56 to 14. You know, I said a couple times leading up to this game, the more I think about it, the more I, I like grace preps chances. I had thought it was only a 10 point game back in October. Um, I like grace preps passing attack a lot. And then all of that just got thrown out the window and TCS Lubbock absolutely blitzed them. So in terms of the stats for TCS Lubbock, Marcus Ramon Edwards rushed for 200 net yards, five touchdowns, the long of 68 yards. Quarterback Eli Reeves rushed for 183 yards and a touchdown with a long of 71. Eli Davis got 30 yards on the ground, another touchdown rushing. In terms of passing, they only threw four 34 total yards um, and two touchdowns. But, you know, this rushing attack for TCS Lubbock is absolutely filthy. So, Walker Lot, TCS Lubbock just exceeds expectations here and looks very good rolling into a matchup with Dallas Christian next week. But your thoughts on them stomping Grace Prep? Yeah, Marcus Ramon Edwards said, uh, "I'll call game basically," and said, "Hey, put put this put the, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
mm, you know, put that backpack oh. on and I, and I'll lead the way. And not, I'm not discrediting Eli, the both Eli's Davis and Reeves. They had a fantastic games, but 208 yards and five touchdowns. He said, put it, put it on my back. Let me go to work and let me be the Texas tech commit. And I'm very, that's what you need to do in big time games like this. Uh, but I'm going to spend my time uh, talking about grace prep and Jalen Talton, that career. Um, what a career man he's had at grace prep, you know, uh, he should just be proud of, you know, he had a lot of big time games. He had a lot of re- great results. He's going to be a great, I wouldn't be surprised if he holds a couple records there at, uh, at grace prep after all these couple years he's played there. Um, heck of a career, man. You should be proud of yourself. Uh, congratulations. Um, I'm, I, I'm excited to see what the future is. Cause you know, they've had, him for at least three years, maybe four at the helm. And it's going to be interesting to see who's going to be the next guy to step up because they still have Broadway and they have a uh, lay for next year. So they'll still have weapons. They have a couple other guys, but um, they lose him. They lose Mathis. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a brand. It's going to be a different grace prep team next year, which we haven't seen truly for a while now. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Ryan Schroeder, TCS Lubbock dog walks, grace prep. Your thoughts are on the lions effort. I actually knew this game was not going to be close. I think I said that as well. Um, I, I just, I don't, I, I knew that that Marcus Rowan Edwards and Eli Reeves would, would kind of take over this game, um, and that's not a LeBron James type of like I knew this would happen type of thing. No, I did know this would actually happen. <laughs> I knew it. I, I knew it. I like I'm, I'm dead serious. I knew that. Yeah. However, when I say that though, this gives us so, so much Micah Bell energy, does it not? Like this, the Kincaid offense in general. This this gives off Kincaid energy a hundred percent because of the fact that they only threw two passes, and obviously they're two. T- uh, what's it called it was a, you know, it was a touchdown, right? But um, it it just gives off like every single play is a run play, and you know it's going to be a run play. So stop it, right? Like it put everybody in the box because you know it's going to be a run play, and uh, they still can't do it, right? So very much that energy. But dude, I love this next year. Marcus Ron Everest goes off Texas Tech. Eli Reeves gets a step up and is, is going to be a senior next year. Um, he's already putting up 183 yards himself. Uh, he's going to be a leader on the TCS Lubbock team next year. And uh, there's a reason why, um, you know, there's a reason why he's been, he's kind of, been, he's been under Marcus Ron Everest at this point. He's kind of coaching him up to be the, be the next guy up. So um, they still got a championship to win this year, though. So. Uh, we'll see what the dual power of Marksman Edwards and Eli Reeves can do. M- moving on, very quick recap. Holy Cross beats Bay Area 28-7. to uh, Rudy Rodriguez, Joe Angel Perez, and Gibby Alvarado and company get the job done. Walker Lott, um, a big win here. A game that we thought might have been a little bit closer, but Holy Cross looks in tip-top shape moving into a matchup with Cypress Christian. Your thoughts on the Knights getting it done? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I couldn't find we couldn't find any stats. So if you are from Holy Cross, please let us know more about your squad. That would be much appreciated. Um, Bay Area, big. You know they lose a couple guys last year: Smith, Nave, Adam Atwell, like we said before. Uh, but Cade Sink and the company were still a good team. You know, second in that District Four, but big win for Holy Cross over them. And they really never looked like they were. Uh, uh, any scared or moment that they could not win this game. Uh, Holy Cross cruises to the semifinal for Division Three over a team that they have believed they face quite regularly in Cypress Christian in the playoffs. Yeah, definitely. So Cypress Christian has actually knocked them out in the last two years of the playoffs. I, I spoiled that. That was part of my preview for this game, but I might as well say it now. Ryan Schroeder, Holy Cross, big win over Bay Area. Your thoughts? Yeah, Gibby Alvarado. Give me Gibby, man. God. She's a Gibby. Gibby. No, he's probably heard that so many times. In his do you life. think kids feel... still? Do you think these kids grew up? No, there's no way they know I Carly. No, they oh, do. Dude, that, well, he's a he, okay. He's a 25, right? So let's think about this logistically. If he's a 25, oh. oh gosh, what 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 really... year was he born? So he's six okay, years on. younger than me. So what were oh one? So oh, oh my seven. God, he was born in 2007. Oh my. Was he actually born in 2000? Guys, we're getting old. I'm talking to the seniors today, and I'm thinking, I'm like, oh yeah, remember when, like, you know, like whoever, whoever played for this team, or like, I, uh, who was I mentioning? I was mentioning like, uh, somebody random on like another team, like a women's team, and they were like, who? I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't know private school sports from like two years ago because you were in high school. I was like, oh my gosh, 
But yeah, I, I feel old every single time I talk to a younger, younger underclassman. The relentless passage of time waits for no man. Please Anyways. let us yeah, let us know down below if you've seen I have Carly. And don't be like you've seen clips. Like you went down like in the morning or afternoons and you watched it after school. No, I, I can guarantee you Gibby's heard it just because the amount of people that like he would have heard it from over yeah. the years. Like there's he has heard and that's also who who do you know the name Gibby? He's the only person I know named Gibby that I've ever met. So and his name real name is Gilbert. So let me just I, I just I have to don't laugh. Don't laugh at that. Don't laugh at that. His name is Gilbert. I didn't laugh right? at that. I laughed at no, you something did. else. I saw him no, like a No, that's that's not true. Uh Continue. no, Gibby Gibby Albrot is a stud. He's twenty twenty five. And uh, I'm telling you, he's the reason why they win games for sure. Um, uh, the team is stacked as well. But, yeah, I knew they won this game as well. Um, but you won't be my best friends in Cypress Christian. No, I'm just kidding. We have to see who my pick is in a second. Oh, I, I actually have um, I have allocated a lot of time. Um, I have allocated a lot of time for you to discuss your thoughts on that matchup. So I'm very excited for it. <laughs> Is that what you've been downloading the past two minutes? Give, give me, give me, uh, give me a the, the best thing is, is like you know the parents that are watching this. You know some some of y'all have like older kids that are now in college <laughs> that you remember sitting down and watching iCarly with your kids and like know this kid like, and you remember Gibby. I wasn't allowed to watch iCarly for a long time. Really? I, I think You're such a private cause... school kid. You're such a private school kid. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so funny. I wasn't allowed to watch that or SpongeBob for a really no! long time. No, I couldn't. No, I couldn't play. SpongeBob. I couldn't play Call it's of Duty always... games for a long time, dude. I, wait, why yeah. are we back on Jordan Green? Sorry. Always that. Yeah. Poor um, guy. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm the definition of a private school kid. I can't lie. Hence why I'm why I'm one third of the Texas private school podcast. Moving on, I told you this is going farther off the rails than anyone could have possibly imagined. Nolan versus Antonian, the last game that we're gonna cover, a game that me and Walker were at on George at in Georgetown on Saturday. I'm forgetting basic grammar. We're actually gonna plug in. We had Thankfully, we we had thanks to Walker's ideas. We recorded um, our halftime thoughts on the game and our post game thoughts on the game. We're gonna play those back to back right here. All right, so we're here at halftime in Georgetown. Nolan Cadley versus Antonian Prep. It is so cold, I can't feel my hands. But me and Walker are pushing through. Walker, um, very good game here at the half. 17-14, Nolan Cadley. Like I was saying right before half, I can't get a good read on how this game is going. It's so evenly matched. What are your takeaways from the first half? I mean, I, the passing game for both teams is very, very impressive, but you have to respect uh, running the ball, both squads. DK Smitting on the Nolan side has been running the ball really, really well with Robert Jones, I believe. And the, the oh, Tony and Hall to Cole Matsuda connection is deadly. Cole, Tony is having a field day right now. But... Rally showed is making him his presence known on the defensive and offensive side. Jace Toscano with two big plays, I know, to Rally Shirt, one of them being a score. One thing I wanted to highlight, this matchup, Antonio Hall at receiver versus Riley Strode at cornerback. Basically, Riley Strode is shadowing Hall wherever he goes. It's fantastic to watch. Antonio's had some big plays, but Strode has very quietly made his presence known. Like you said, he's tailing Antonio everywhere. He's breaking up passes. Both of these kids are elite athletes. It'll be fantastic to watch. What are your projections for the second half? I think it's going to be a lot of just try, Nolan trying to establish a running game more uh, than having to throw it up to Antonio if needed. It's going to be a very interesting game. We'll see how Antonio matches that. Uh, the Antonio with uh, the rally and others. It's a good game. Uh, Ricky Gonzalez needs to get in the ball more, honestly. You know, get him working a little bit more, too. Passing is going to be deadly, especially with his cold. Who's going to will themselves to a win to here today? Absolutely. It'll be very interesting to see what adjustments are made at half. But this has been your halftime hot chocolate talk with Wes and Walker. We'll see you in the next half. All right. Obviously, Wes Tallis and Walker Lock coming to you after a 37-24 to victory for Nolan Catholic over Antonian Prep. Walker, I'm so cold I can't even think straight. But we mentioned it was a back-and-forth affair. It was hard to tell who was getting momentum at any point in the game. And then Nolan just started to pull away late due to the fantastic play of DK Smittick, Antonio Hall, and number 22, Robert... Robert Jones. Robert, Robert Jones. Jones. But yeah, I mean, those three guys were fantastic all night for Nolan. Your thoughts on the Vikings getting a win here? Yeah, I think the run game way was very, very important, you know, to get stated in that game. And, you know, in the first half, they got it stated. In the second half, they continued to do 
do it. Second half team stayed true, and that running game was just something that you know the front seven for uh, Antonio could just could not stop. And getting the three, getting three yards and three yards and five yards, seven yards, and just slowly, slowly going down the field is just hard to stop. And that's what Antonio couldn't do, and that gave Nolan the win. Big plays by Antonio Hall and others were, of course, really, really important. But the running game is really what stood out to me. Absolutely, you have to tip your cap to Ricky Gonzalez, Jason Toscano, and Riley Strode. A fantastic season for the Antonio Apaches, but. It will end here in the quarterfinals. Nolan will advance next week to play the winner of pa or no, Preston they Wood. Play, versus yeah, they play Preston Wood. Uh, so that game will probably be get played somewhere in Dallas around there. Hey, maybe somewhere like Globe Life or something like that again. But we'll see. Uh, that's going to be a very interesting matchup to see. You know, Preston Wood won the regular season matchup. It's interesting to see how Nolan can respond and maybe come out with a different victory, different result than before. <laughs> Speaking of Globe Life Park, Ryan Schroeder will be there tonight covering Bishop Lynch and Parish Episcopal. Should be a great game. Keep up on this feed for updates from that game from Ryan. But as for Walker Lot and West Hallison, we will see you later. Thanks for watching. Okay, so those were our halftime and our post-game thoughts. I'm glad you got to see both of us absolutely freezing. <laughs> I thought I thought our hot chocolate time was was very, very wholesome, Walker. But Walker, I mean, we 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 discuss everything at length there. I don't really want to discuss a recap of the game, so we discuss it there. I do want to mention yeah. someone I forgot to mention in the post game. Sophomore Robert Jones had 24 carries, 155 yards, two touchdowns. He went, he was fantastic. Some official stats on DK Smittick. 28 carries, 185 yards rushing and a touchdown. Just a fantastic effort um, for the boys from Nolan. Any any closing thoughts you have from this game before I switch to Ryan? Yeah, like I said, the running game for Nolan was very, very impressive. And the, when the Antonio offense couldn't get to go in and you just get it, getting gashed for three to four yards of play by that Nolan running game, it was just disgusting. So hats off to that offensive line. Firstly, got to give my love to the big guys up front and those two running backs. Uh what a career for Ricky Gonzalez, one of the best wide receivers in taps in all of private school this past couple of years. Uh, big congrats to him. You know, he had a heck of a career. Uh, wish him the best at the next level. Definitely so. Ryan, any quick thoughts on Nolan versus Antonian? The North is better than the South. The North is always better than the South. And I think it's, I think what we just have to realize that at all times. This is a team that went two and eight this year. Bishop Lynch team that went two and seven. Exact same thing. Both won their first round game. Bishop Lynch didn't beat Parrish, but no one ends up beating Antonian in the, uh, let's call it, in the second round. It just proves, like, Nolan Catholic played a hard schedule, like a super hard schedule. I think I said this on the last oh, episode, yeah. so I'm not going to repeat myself. Um, but it just it just proves that, like, no one put themselves, like, and, and Cole Matsuda and all those guys and all that kind of stuff, they put themselves to the test this year when it came to the non-district schedule. Um, and and now and now they're winning games like no no other. Beating an Antonian prep team that I mean, we all were high on. I've I've never seen Antonian play this year, but I was kind of high on as well from what I heard. Um, and you know, it it, it it's kind of just it's crazy to see because we, we we know in D two kind of like you know it's a little bit closer and stuff like that. But and obviously in D four is where it's the most even. But um, I think D one is just it's so far. Like the the the, the separation is so far, and, and it's not yeah. even close. There's no one in D one that can compete, and there's no one in the South in D one that can, can really compete. Yeah, no, I I don't think so. I want to say uh, this was another ref game that was that was rough. And I will, yeah. and, and I will, I'll give Antonian credit that they had a lot of calls that weren't called their way that were kind of shocking that even I, I just as a bystander on the sideline was like, oh, you didn't call that. Like that's in like, it was, it was wild. I, I'll give them that. I don't know if it would have changed the game. Cause you did, you know, you threw interceptions and you got stopped a lot in the, your side of the field. So I don't know, maybe instead of a 14 point game, it would have been a seven point game. But uh, very, very hard to uh, refing. It was very, very rough, rough, rough game down there in Georgetown by the ref crew. I would have to agree. Um, there's nothing um, polite I could add to this conversation. Um, my thoughts on TAPS refs have been well documented from my playing days whenever – um, you know what? That's a story for another day. That will conclude our discussion on Nolan versus Antonian, and that will conclude our reviews of – the past five games of the week as a whole. And now, before we get into other news, a word from our sponsor, ScoreVision. This show is sponsored by ScoreVision. Are you looking to upgrade your scoreboards? ScoreVision is a cloud-based, 
user-friendly software with an affordable suite of tools so you can keep score, boost athlete exposure, increase fan engagement, and enhance your game day experience. Head over to www.scorevision.com for more information. Scorevision. Experience the game. Power the athlete. So thank you again to Score Vision for sponsoring this episode. And now in what is probably the greatest thing that this podcast has ever created or raised or commented on, we are now going to debate um, off of some inspiration from No Context TXPS. Could the U.S. men's national team beat Wales with a starting lineup of parish Episcopal football players? Um <laughs> We're going. We're going to debate this. We're going to debate this. Me and Walker. Walker doing the brunt of the work because I don't know. I don't know um, soccer positions from Adam. Walker is an avid U.S. men's national team fan. If you can't tell by the hat, so we sat down and we basically just thought of athletic guys from Parish and put them in positions. We're going to have a graphic for this as well that may or may not be on the screen when we're talking about this. Walker, um, we're not. We we we've already taken a long time this episode, but some quick thoughts on why some of these players are where they are all right i'll go quickly you know i'm a big i've gotten really big in the soccer and uh f1 the past couple of months uh past year basically so i've gotten into new sports so we did this you know world cup season uh james cave 6'6 240 big man in the in, in between the posts uh i think he'd be athletic but also good enough in the height length uh to be their our, ga- our guy in the goal uh kayla mitchell earthing trey williams the two big athletic center backs they can be causing some damage, but also be the leadership in the back. Especially Trey, you need that center back leadership. Walker Anderson, Cedric May, speed, athleticism at the wing backs, but also, you know, Walker has a defensive mindset. And Cedric, you know, was versatile. Sometimes you need your wing backs to go forward and be attacking, or sometimes you need them to be defensive. And Cedric, I believe, can bring that. Walker, you know, defensive corner, brings the speed, athleticism to do that. In the middle, you have the CDM, Cooper Malin, uh, the defensive-minded monster. You know what? No one's getting through Cooper. It can help out the defense, but also can play it upfield. That's who kind of how he is. Uh, Daniel Demery, the meter, the box-to-box type of guy, um, can play defensively, but also can be uh, the attacking if he needs to go forward, just like he plays in uh, for Parrish. If he needs to play offense, he can, but is more the defensive leader as well, box-to-box type of guy. The cam, the attacking midfielder, who else than the target man himself, Sawyer Anderson, can pick and pass her passes just like he does in football, gets where the ball needs to go. Um, big, big, I think it was a perfect fit for him at the camp position, being the guy to kind of be the maestro for this parish uh soccer team. <laughs> on the on the on the <laughs> on the side, Derek Usbiel, you know, a speed athleticism on the outside can attack like he does in football. He dukes, he makes people miss. That's a perfect guy for a right wing, left wing. Bryson Blackmore, you know, the speed, the you know, the catching ability is definitely there for the DB spot. But he also has that speed athleticism because he has to keep up with all his receivers. He can play our left wing. Also at six foot, he can come in for the crosses if needed and get the guy. Now Maddox Reed, game changer, like he always is, and that's why he's our striker. You know, 5'9", so he's a little smaller than like maybe a mid, like a target man, but he can be our center forward, picking and passing to the guys when it need to be. But as he does in football, he makes the plays and does what he knows, and he scores. That is what Maddox Reed does is he scores and he's going to do the same thing for our soccer team for Parish Episcopal FC. Um, great job. I think they don't beat Wales, but <laughs> I <laughs> just... we do all of this for you to say they don't win. What are we? <laughs> I mean, no, they win. No, they're winning. No, they're winning. No, brother, they're they not win. beating. Maybe. Listen to me. Listen to me. Here's what here's why they're Gareth gonna win. Bell. We have we have Caleb Mitchell Irving who is better than Walker Zimmerman. If Caleb Mitchell <laughs> Irving is playing center back, we don't foul Gareth Bale in the box and give give the 36 year old Welsh, I'm not going to use that word, a penalty in the whatever minute. 82nd. 82nd minute. Caleb, Caleb Mitchell Irving does not give up a penalty. We don't lose. Parish Episcopal beats Wales. Ryan Schroeder, thoughts? <laughs> My favorite position is Sawyer at the cam. I think that's perfect. I think Thank that you. absolutely fits it. He's like the quarterback of like the team. You know, he's like pointing out different things where they need to go type of thing, right? But then 
Also, another position I love, I love Derek at the right wing, by the way. That also is sick. But uh, Cedric Mays at the right back. That's perfect. That's perfect. He's like he's like the quick outside defender and stuff like that. It makes so much sense, in my opinion. Um, uh, the rest of them, yeah. I, I, James K. But the goalkeeper is just hilarious to me. Trey Williams, holy crap, he would big body somebody. He would absolutely – uh, he's the, have y'all seen the girl uh, that like just trucks over the other players like that one on have y'all seen that yet the girl that's uh, playing soccer and she just goes and trucks over like two defenders and stuff like that to go get the ball and no. everyone in the comment section is a bunch of dads all being like being like well that's not the right way to play soccer and like whatever Trey Williams just gives off that type of vibe except for the actual fact that yeah. he would truck over guys so now uh, I want to give credit, you know, the, some of the other offensive defensive linemen, you know, this is not your game, but I'm sorry. You know, they just, your, your skills just don't translate to this game, but you will be the best bench team and the best supporting group anyone has ever seen. And, you know, who's, who's, who's coming on? Who's uh, coming on as a sub? I think uh, like a Kamsi, Areen, uh, Rinza. I think uh, like a, like a, what is it? Chase Burton. I think uh, a Fields. Uh, I think Nick Nick Nicholas Ferris, the offensive tackle, the six seven guy, can be the backup goalie. Uh, okay, I like that. Uh, I think uh Cooper or Parker Meese could be the other CDM. I think Seth Scott, the other linebacker, could be the other guy, the center back. This um, has been well fleshed out. Is is, is Novikov still the manager? Oh no, Absolutely. without a doubt. If he okay. can, if okay. he can be, if he can have a perfection of an offense and defense and taps Division One, he can beat the, the Wales, the Welsh national team at the World Cup in Qatar. Absolutely. So the jury, uh, Walker says they they don't beat Wales. I say they do. Ryan Schroeder, <laughs> I think you also agree with me that this team beats Wales and at least hey. uh, at least keeps it within keeps. You know what? They draw England. I say they draw England as well. Mm. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, sadly, we have to leave behind the greatest segment we have ever done in the history of this podcast and talk about our five games of the week. But before that, we're going to give you our very our picks and basically one sentence thoughts on the three other games being played. The first being Preston Christian versus Nolan Catholic. Um, I'm going with Prestonwood here. I'm not overthinking it. Prestonwood bested them in the regular season. Um, I think they get it done here again. Walk a lot. Prestonwood uh, has a real has been very good in playoffs. You know, big win over uh, St. Pius, and they're going to continue with a big win over Nolan Catholic here to head to the state championship. Ryan Schroeder, your thoughts? Give me uh, Prestonwood Christian. By the way, I saw Co- saw Coco as uh, chick um, play today, play basketball. I was so sad. He still has a wide receiver in his bio, and I was really sad that he's not playing because he'd be such a stud of the wide receiver. He's been really good at basketball, by the way. Um, anyways, all to say, Prestonwood's going to win this game. Uh, don't ever think it. They're the second best team in Division One. Can't wait for Noel to win this game. Then have a bunch of moms pull phones on us uh, after the game. Although we won't be at this game for them to expose uh, us. So uh, no, they'll, they'll probably there. show up. They'll probably show up to our. Oh, you will be there, won't you? I'll, oh, thank the there. Lord, you have to deal with that, and not me and Walker. Moving on into the next game, Fort Worth Christian versus Fort Worth All Saints. I am taking All Saints here. Um, sorry, Jordan Green. I know we picked against y'all a lot this season. It, no hard feelings. I think All Saints is just finally turning into the team that we thought they would be preseason. Jalen Spriggs, Javon Williams, and company. Very, very. Very elite Walker lot. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to go forward with all sense here. You know, they're very on fire right now. They're on a very big streak right now. And I think Fort Worth Christian, you know, they, they love to come back and uh, win games, but I just don't think it's going to happen in this one. Give me forward with all sense. Ryan Schroeder, you alluded to this. We think the comeback kids have one more game in them. I pick Fort Worth Christian here and they lose this game. I swear I'm never picking Fort Worth Christian ever again. I will never pick this team ever again. All right. I did not just spend nine hours there today just for y'all to lose. I did not just hear from all y'all today saying how you're going to win this game. I did not hear from parents and everybody else today telling me, why did you, why did you pick Midland? Why did y'all all pick Midland? It's for you to lose this game. I just saw this All Saints team. I know how good this dang team is. I know how much moxie Jalen Spriggs has, and he's going to walk off the field like this uh, right after he wins the game. And I'm going to have to sit there and watch him, watch him do, watch him do that. I'm going to have to sit there and watch him do that if they win. All right. So I have four with Christian in this game, but my goodness, if y'all lose this game. I'm walking right over to Jalen Sprague and I'm taking a photo of him as he does the little McGregor walk on the way out. 
I don't think there is any greater celebration on this planet than McGregor Walker. I think that that is that is top tier celebration. And hopefully for my sake, we get to see Jalen Spriggs do it following a Saints win. Moving to the last game, we're going to briefly cover um, Love It Christian versus Brazos Christian. I love, 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 love Coach Washington. Um Everyone else at Brazos Christian. I think Lubbock, Lubbock Christian is the best team in D4. Um, Bax Townsend is a dude. Give me Lubbock Christian here. Walker. Yeah, I think Brazos Christian has had a really good season. They have a lot of talent. And Ryan Burton and company are a really good squad. But I think Lubbock Christian is going to be too much for them in this matchup. Give me Lubbock Christian and Bax Townsend. The man in Stillwater. I mean, Frisco. Sorry. That's crazy. I uh, don't overthink a little bit, Christian. Bax Townsend's a dog. The rest of this team is a really good supporting cast. Honestly, this team has a chance to win state. Give me a little bit, Christian. Fantastic. And now into the detailed analysis, starting with Paris versus St. Thomas, in which the Panthers are a 27 and a half point favorite. On Saturday, the best teams from the North and the South, respectively, will face off at 2 o'clock in Belton. We mentioned several weeks back that St. Thomas was likely the only D1 team that poised anything resembling a threat to the Panthers. Dante Lewis, Luke Edgecombe, Schaefer Henderson, Johard Grandinius, who I'm still not sure if he is back from injury or not, but also Jack Ward, Grant Stewart, and others all have put St. Thomas in a position to dethrone the Kings of private school. However, Sawyer Anderson, Trey Williams, Daniel Demery, Parker Meese, and Caleb Mitchell Irving will have other plans. Paris has lived up to expectations and then some this year, averaging 43 points per game in district competitions behind one of the best offensive lines in the state. There is nothing close to a weakness in this Panthers team, and almost every position group is nothing short of elite. Walker, you've seen Parrish and mentioned how they just outclass everyone in the trenches specifically, and for that reason, I want the Panthers in this game. Give me Parrish. Your thoughts, Walker? Yeah, you kind of mentioned my point that I've kind of made in the previous episodes, and I'm going to say it again now. Because of that, I'm going to go Parrish. I think it's very interesting to see because being real, looking at Antonian and seeing also St. Thomas early in the season, I did not think it should have been that close, and they should have. I don't think they should have lost. Because they have too much talent offensively. I'm wondering, you know, Johan Cardenas is out for the year, I believe, right? So that's going to be a big loss for them. But I didn't know it was going to be that big offensively uh, to cause that much damage. So, um, but I don't think anyone can match Parrish in the trenches, um, especially with Johan Cardenas out to not make something happen himself. I don't think they can win this game. Uh they're going to Dante Lewis is going to have to have a fantastic game trying to escape the pocket and cause some havoc. If he wants a chance to win this game, to give it to his receivers, I will give, I'll say this though. Um, I don't think this defensive back group for parish has had anything close to these receivers uh, since probably South Oak cliff um, and receiving talent. They're going to have to face this year. The receivers for um uh, St. Thomas are really, really impressive, and Dante is a really good quarterback. So if you can get it to them and make them kind of have some fun, um, having 6'3", six, 6'4", six, Schaefer and Larry kind of go against maybe Walker and Bryson um, at this cornerback spots could could be interesting. But um, I don't think they – there's going to be no way they really truly run the ball on Parrish will give me uh, Parrish. Ryan Schroeder. I just saw this team play. This is the best private school team I've ever seen play in my entire life, by by far. I, I didn't get to see Parrish in the playoffs last year, um, in the championships last year, because I was at my own um, Big 12 championship game. So I, I missed that. But I've, I've never seen Parrish play before. Never knew how good they were. Um, this, is the best, this is the best team I've ever seen. They're they're so elite. Um, if if uh, Novikov plays the bench like he normally does when it comes to like, the fourth quarter, uh, they could, it could be less than 27 and a half, but I think they still cover, yeah, 30 point spread. Um, this Paris team's elite. They, they, they're elite on, like you said, every skill position, every single, you know, uh, offensive line, defense line. They're just super skilled. Um, I have Paris by 30 for sure. Best, best private school team ever. Yeah, no, I think I think they are that good, and it's crazy that 30 is not even that bold of a take, but it will be interesting to see what kind of fight St. Thomas puts up and if they can make this a game. Moving on into the second game we're going to cover, Fort Bend Christian versus Second Baptist in a game where Fort Bend is a five-and-a-half-point favorite. On Saturday at 2 p.m. at Del Mar Stadium, two old foes will face off for the second and final time this season. You can't talk about Fort Bend Christian and Second Baptist without bringing up the past. 
November 5th, 2021, Fort Bend Christian beat Second Baptist 27-24 to to dethrone them for the district championship. Three weeks later, on November the 27th, Second Baptist enacts their revenge behind a masterful game plan from Terry Pirtle, knocking Fort Bend Christian out of the playoffs 14-13 to at Rice Stadium. Fast forward to October 14, 2022. Second Baptist dominates Fort Bend Christian 28-7 to at home and wins the district championship. These teams do not like each other. Second Baptist is the traditional power. Fort Bend Christian is new blood. Second Baptist is grit and grind. Fort Bend Christian is flashy and in your face. It is a meeting of oil and water, a meeting that Second Baptist single-handedly dominated in October. But this is not October. Brian Domino is back. Tyler Curry is playing like a new man. Max Granville is wreaking havoc on front sevens. Brady Dever is launching nukes on opposing defenses. I have been wrong in this exact spot before, but I'm saying it with my chest right now. Give me the Fort Bend Christian Eagles. I want them to win this game. Walker Lott, your thoughts? I feel chills. That was really good, man. <laughs> I, was, I feel some chills going on, man. Um, I was at this game, and it was very interesting to watch because the Second Baptist offense, defense, special teams absolutely destroyed Fort Bend. Fort Bend's offense was absolutely non-existent, but now it is. So it's hard for me to like wrap my hand, wrap my uh, head around that because it just it is so interesting to see the changing of this team. Um, I believe JD Crisp might be out, so that's going to be a huge loss for him. He was a big part of that win, but after watching him live and watching a couple other of those players, I can't go against Colin Cormorgan. Kyle Cormorgan is that dude, um, and he he impressed me so much in that game. He had a big game against uh, TWCA. Kind of put the team is going to put the team on his back. Eleven carries for one forty three and two touchdowns against TWCA. Um, give me Murdoch. Give me Cormorgan. Give me Bryce Butler. Give me uh, everyone on that squad. Uh, give me. Uh, second Baptist. Now, don't get me wrong. I think this is going to be a war. I think this is going to go back and forth. I think Fort Bend is not going to go out like this game. They There's so much blood. There's bad blood between these two schools. I think Fort Bend is going to have a real shot to win this game. But I think Colin Cormorgan is just a guy that when the lights turn on, he's ready to go. And I think he's going to play his heart out and maybe edge them out in this game. So give me second Baptist. Fantastic analysis. Ryan Schroeder, your thoughts. Yeah, so J.D. Crisp had 100 yard total yards in the last game. Um, now, what does that mean? doesn't mean really anything. And obviously, they have Kyle Cor Morgan. He also put up 100 yards and two touchdowns in that game. He's obviously a stud for them as well. Um, with that being said, though, I really, I really don't want to pick Fort Bend, but I will. Um, because I just saw Brady Dever put up 400 total yards, and I kind of think that's really impressive. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go for a bit here. Um, they're going to flip the script here. This is a second Baptist team that lost, um, if I can count this right, they lost uh, four out of their first five games. Um, they played super hard teams in Preston with Bellard, Episcopal, St. John's, and Kincaid. However, you have to realize that this is a team that um, – that that was without, without JD Crisp, who was the district MVP, um, and Kyle Cor Morgan cannot do it all by himself. Obviously, he has supporting cast as well, but you're going to have to give me the red hot Brady Dever and every other dominant guy on that team. Definitely so. It'll be very, very interesting to see what happens between those two old foes this coming week. Moving on into the third game, we're going to preview Dallas Christian versus Trinity Christian of Lubbock. DC is a 21 and a half point favorite, which is wild for a state semifinal. But don't let the spread fool you. Expect an absolute war in Clyde at 6 p.m. on Saturday. TCS has only improved as the year has gone on, indicated by a 56-14 dismantling of Grace Prep last week. Senior Texas Tech commit Marcus Rowan Edwards is arguably the best player in D3, and with Eli Reeves, Hunter Mass, and Zach Anthony will have a fighting shot in this game. 
but DC brings talent to the table as well, and boy, do they have it in excess. Whether I'm highlighting the backfield of sophomore quarterback Luke Carney and senior Zach Hernandez, junior athlete Speedy Nettles, and Cole Burke and Porter Nix in the trenches, this DC team is the parish of Division Three. TCS will be their greatest test of the season, and I love this Lions squad, but DC wins this one, point blank period. Walker Lott, your thoughts? This is a good one. This is one I, I wish it was closer, man, because I would have drove out there um, and watched it. Because, But I believe it's out near Abilene, and I just I can't make that drive. But this is this is a good one, man. Um, mm, you know, this is the one we, we've been talking about forever. This is the game in Division Three that we're excited for. Um, you know... I agree with you that Marcus Roman Edwards is arguably the best player in D3. But the other guy on the other side, Speedy Nettles, is arguably the best player in Division 3 as a soft or as a soft or junior. Speedy Nettles is that dude, and he's playing his tail off these past couple of weeks. I know he had a pick six last week. Um, playing both sides of the ball now. And I think he's gonna have a huge game. Him and Carney are gonna have to have a huge game. I think they're gonna be able to maybe stop the run with Zach Hernandez because they have a good defense. But I don't know if there's gonna be anyone that can come close to Speedy Nellis and Luke Carney uh passing passing the ball. So give me Dallas Christian. I like it. Ryan Schroeder. All right. Okay. I'll tell y'all something. I'll tell y'all something. Oh god. Tell us something. Dallas Christian is eleven and one this year. Mm. TCS Loving's 10 and 2 or 10 mm. and 2, correct. Yes. Mm. I'll tell you something straight out real quick. The last time this Dallas Christian team played anybody of any significance, the last games that they played against Brook Hill, Colleyville, Covenant, Shelton McKinney, Brook Hill, Dallas Covenant. I don't write them off as anything. Okay. Last day at the time they played a really good team was Fort Worth Christian and they lost. And mm. I was there. And I saw it happen. I saw the crumble of Dallas Christian. All right. Now I'm not saying anything crazy, because yes, you honestly, <laughs> keep it. Let it I, let, let him go. Keep going. Because I'll tell you this: Forest Christian passes the ball, and TCS Lubbock just runs the ball. All right, mm -hmm. the rush defense for Dallas Christian is elite, which is why I'm worried. However, if you get to a point where you're like Micah Bell and the Kincaid offense, where you run every single play and there's nothing they can do to stop you. Then I have it. Eli Reeves and the boy Marcus Ramon Edwards, I believe, can power through this and can win this game. Marcus Ramon Edwards is a stud. He's going to bulldoze people. And I believe that they win this game against D.C. The fall of Dallas Christian is this year. It's happening in D3. Everybody thinks they're going to sweep this year because it's Division Three. TCS Lubbock sees them, and they're going to beat them. Give me TCS Lubbock. First off, also, let me say this. The South is terrible in D3. Both these teams would wipe the South. Cypress Christian or Holy Cross playing either of these two teams will get ran, okay? The, the championship is is done for. Let me just say that. without Whichever one of these teams wins, it's done for. Neither team so in the, the South is going to win. The, the championship is this game. Yeah, this is the championship by far. This is this is, this is is the this is the best two teams in D3 we've known all year long. Um. Yeah, I'm going to be different here. Also, I, by the way, I need to get games on Wes, so I'm trying to pick differently than him. But <laughs> TCS Lubbock, Marshall and Edwards, count it. I want to, I want to say one last thing. <clears throat> we talked about the rushing defense for DC having to be at its best, and especially in this game. Philip Bazemore is a guy that came in this year and has had a really good season for Dallas Christian, and he's going to have to have a fantastic game. I know Porter plays come, kind of both ways too, but Philip Bazemore is the guy on the defensive line for Dallas Christian, and he's going to have to have a fantastic game, and I think he is going to have a fantastic game in this one. Hey, Porter, you you're going to have to have a good game, brother. You're going to have to have a really, really good game, <laughs> all right? March or whatever, it's coming for you. We got to stop recording so late. It's just a fever dream at this point. And I love I've, this. Now, now that we've wound Ryan up, I'm terrified to preview this game. Cypress Christian versus Holy Cross. <laughs> Couldn't <laughs> find a spread on it. Blame Massey Let's ratings. Run it, baby. Let's we're run gonna it. we're gonna have to cut at least 80, 80 seconds of this in post. So 
I literally have it scripted to say, I'll be brief because I want to hear Ryan's rationale here. But at 7 o'clock on Friday in Giddings, our projected Division Three semifinal matchup will take place. The Knights of Holy Cross will roll into the contest 10-1, and and the combined play of Gibby Alvarado, Rudy Rodriguez, and Joe Angel Perez have led Holy Cross back into the semis. But their season has been ended each of the last two years by the Warriors of Cypress Christian. Is this year Alvarado and companies to overcome Landrum and Hogan squad? I think so. I'm riding for the 726. Give me Holy Cross in this matchup. Walker Lot, we'll let Ryan Schroeder go last. Speak to Holy Cross? Yeah. Sorry about it. <laughs> We're keeping it in. We're keeping it in. That dude, that he he said, that, you... that brother folded. I didn't even know what happened. Uh, all right. You know what? Whatever. Walker, just pick real quick. We'll just figure this out. Um, I'm going to make a pick Cypress. <laughs> um, I really like this Holy Cross team. Um, This is an interesting one because we haven't really seen much of Cyprus or Holy Cross this year. We haven't seen either team in person. Wes, luckily, will be down there this week to go watch this game, so I know he's going to be excited for this one to watch these two teams. Um, I haven't heard much about Land- uh, Landrum and the squad. You know, we don't know who. We knew a lot about Griffin Fisk and others, Cody Andrews, uh, others, but we don't know who else Landrum really has on the squad. Um, Rudy Rodriguez, Gibby, and Joe Angel Perez are good players, and I, I'm going to agree with you, man. I think it is going to be Holy Cross this year in this one. Give me San Antonio Holy Cross. Ryan Schroeder. I just shut myself up for a second. Sorry. All right. First off, before I even start going crazy, I'm just going to be logical for a second. Dude, Joe Angel Perez is having a great year, by the way. He's getting more than – let's count this up. He's had 13-plus touches. Actually, sorry, I'm, the one game he had six touches, he had 220 yards. Wow. Uh, he has 13-plus touches in the past uh, – just the past five games and has over 113 yards in each – or over 100 yards in each game. Um, he's just so elite. He has already had – he has 1,400 yards in the year. Um, he He's a stud. He's proving to be a stud every single game. I need him to be a dang stud in this game. And, and I said Gibby was the main factor, but honestly, Joe Angel Perez is putting a name for himself more than even Gibby is. Gibby, you know, is still doing well, 77 yards in, in this in Geneva game is what I'm specifically looking at. But, yeah, Joe Angel Perez is a stud. So, there you go. Now, let's be illogical here. Christian, although you have all these good players, Massa Landrum, you have a great coach. Chris Hogan's a great coach. All I have to say is that Holy Cross and, you know, Mr. Gibe and uh, my boy Joe, Angel Perez, are going to run y'all, and they're going to show what it's actually like to play someone competitive in D3 on your track to a championship. I have a question. And be honest here. Don't don't just don't just try to, like, get out of it. Mm-hmm. Honestly – the South in Division Three, the easiest spot out of all private school to get to the championship. I I might have to agree with him there. I, I can't say it's the easiest in all of private school because I need to have them in front of me, but it's easier than the North. We can agree there. That is true. Okay, right. moving okay. forward. Shiner St. Paul versus Munster Sacred Heart. St. Paul is a two and a half point favorite. Last year's state championship will be played in the state semis this year as Sacred Heart will try to avenge a 36 to 8 title loss last season. And they have a great shot to do it this year behind D4 MVP candidate Ryan Straczynski. Mm-hmm. And with help from Nathan Hess and Gus Ganson, I personally think Sacred Heart gets that revenge and sends St. Paul packing here on Saturday. Walker Lot, your thoughts? Um, yeah, um, big, big, uh, game, you know, Shiner St. Paul lose, uh, of course, you know, guys from last year, they still have a couple of guys, including, um, Jacob, Jacob Waxmith, the quarterback over there. Um, they have a couple of guys and I believe Nate Bodeker is back over there. Bedeker, sorry. Nate Bedeker is back for them after a couple got a couple weeks of them not being there. So, you know, they're being back to what you think Shiner is, but I think Munster 
has had a such a great year. Nathan Hesse, uh, Gus Ganson, Eli Hess is a big man up front, 6'3", 215, and Ryan Swarzynski is a big man, uh, causing a lot of havoc for a lot of teams. So give me Monster Sacred Heart in this one, but I think this is going to be closer than uh, – I know it says two and a half, and I think that's for good reason. I, I'm going to think Shiner is going to put up a good fight. I think it's going to be another good, good matchup here. Uh, give me Monster Sacred Heart. No. Ryan Schroeder. If I'm not mistaken, first time these two teams played, it was 30 to 20 in the star, um, from what I understand. It was a part of that Catholic Bowl weekend that they had, yep. um, from what I understand. I, I am so sorry, um, Monster Sacred Heart. I've given you so much disrespect to this team because the fact I keep saying it's only Ryan Straczynski. This team has other valuable players, and I want to apologize to everybody there because that's that's not very fair for me to say that. Nathan Hess and Gus Ganson are just two of the other valuable players to Ryan Straczynski on this team. Obviously, you know, Ryan Straczynski is a very valuable player. However, I, I keep disrespecting him and saying he's the only player, so I want to apologize for that. Um, this team runs on uh, – quality players runs on a quality team uh, and they're going to, they're going to take down the defending state champ. The, the four, is it four in a row time defending state champions? They're going to, they're going to send them home back in, in my opinion. Um, Shiner St. Paul has been good for so many years. Um, got to figure out their story last year. It was be- beautiful figuring out their entire story last year. Such a cool story. Um, and it's really sad that it's going to come to an end this year. I got Munster Sacred Heart here and all the guys at Munster Sacred Heart winning this game. Fantastic. And that being said, we'll actually conclude all of our games of the week. As always, I've been one third of your hosting crew, Wes Tollison, Walker Lott, and Ryan Schroeder have excellently been themselves. We will see you next week for the state championship preview. I can't believe I'm saying that. See you later. Three, two, one. Here we go.